So welcome to this Travel Weekly webinar in uh, partnership with the Travel Foundation. Uh, I'm Ian Taylor, I'm a journalist with Travel Weekly, and I'm joined by Ben Lynham, Head of Strategic Communications for the Travel Foundation. Ben's going to present the findings of a new Travel Foundation study envisioning tourism in 2030, which models how travel and tourism could look in 2030 and further forward in 2050. The implications of, uh, of uh, this and the actions required in, in, in light of the study's findings. And Ben's presentation is going to be followed by a panel discussion when we'll hear from Paul Peters, Professor of Sustainable Tour Transport and Tourism at Breda University of Applied Science, from Evoet Versloot, a strategist with the Netherlands Board of Tourism, Sophia Mura Muramet, Sustainability Lead at uh, online travel agent Tourradar, uh, based in Vienna, from Rochelle Turner, Head of Sustainability at Tour Operator uh, Exodus Travels, and from Jens Thrainhart, who's Chief Executive of the Barbados Tourism Marketing. Um, so we'll hear from all you uh, shortly. Thanks very much for joining us. And Ben, over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Ian. So um, I'm just going to share um, our findings um, in a short presentation, um, which um, I hope uh, won't take us too long so that we can uh, get um, into uh, the discussion. Um, but we have been working uh, with the organizations that you see on the uh, top right of your screen now um, for the past um, probably close to a year now, I think, um, to really try and understand um, uh, a question, which is this one. Um, what does uh, this, the global commitment to harbor emissions by 2030, and reach net zero as soon as possible before 2050 actually look like. So we've been um, asking people to do this as part of the um, Glasgow Declaration, asking people to plan to halve emissions by 2050 um, and start um, reducing their emissions straight away. And we're wanting to actually understand, well, you know, how can you plan for that? What does this actually look like for people? Um, the idea was that we would um, develop a report that uh, had implications for um, policymakers and for businesses and for destinations. Um, the, the full report is now available on the Travel Foundation website and anyone can access it for free, thanks to the, our sponsors. Okay, so the modelling, um, it's important to note the parameters of the modelling, um, and you'll hear from Paul Peters after the presentation, and he'll be able to give you uh, some more information on that. Um, but it looks at the global travel and tourism system as a whole, um, and that includes transport and accommodations. It's all trips of at least one night away from home, uh, and that is domestic or international for any reason, for holiday, leisure, business, visiting friends and family. Um, and... It, it looks um, both at uh, scope one and scope two mainly. It, it's less so um, this, the scope three, and we acknowledge that um, is particularly uh, important, um, a significant portion of the accommodation sector. It doesn't include cruise either. Um, and again, in the report, we address that point um, and uh, cruise isn't off the hook in the report, but it's not part of the model. Um, and just to emphasize it is global, uh, we weren't able to necessarily um, uh, understand how the scenarios are meant to play out in specific regions or countries or destinations. But again, we can kind of try to understand the implications for uh, different places um, through the report and through some, uh, some further research. Um, but really our starting point um, through, with the model was looking at business as usual. And you can see that there is a big task ahead. Um, so you can see that the emissions are growing and growing um, under business as usual um, over the coming years and, and the coming decades. Uh, but the red line here is telling us where we, uh, where we need to travel, how we need to get uh, to net zero. And you can see that there's a huge um, discrepancy there between business as usual and where we need to be. So, the, um, the model allows us effectively to dial up or dial down um, different interventions based around uh, these seven categories um, on screen. 
Um, our aim was to identify a few different scenarios um, for net zero pathways, um, but we soon uh, realized that basically every single um, sector of travel would need to throw all it has behind climate action. And we ended up with just um, one scenario um, because it's the one scenario where we, we use everything that we have available. Um, we found that the, the following were the most effective, the things that I'm highlighting on screen now, um, and that is in particular um, electrification of transport and accommodation coupled with renewable energy, um, sustainable aviation fuel, um, and that was in particular um, e-fuel uh, rather than uh, biofuels um, uh, from a um, SAF perspective. Um, and invest, investment in infrastructure, such as high-speed rail in particular. Um, but we also needed to tackle the longest haul trips. So the longest haul trips account for 1.9% of all trips in 2019, but 19% of all, uh, so total, tourism emissions. And without intervention, these long-haul trips are set to quadruple and become 41% of all tourism emissions, yet still being only 4.4% of all trips by 2050. So we did come to one option for net zero by combining all of the measures and adding a policy of reducing the rate of growth of aviation, keeping total distance travel by air to around about 2019 levels. And we do get close to net zero by 2050. Although if you note with the um, red dotted line, we still don't reach the 50% reduction by 2030. We get there in about the spring of 2036 instead, which really just goes to show how hard it is to turn this around and begin the, the steep reductions in emissions that we need. In our decarbonisation scenario, so looking on the right hand side here, the overall number of trips increases in line with business as usual. Total revenue also increases, again, roughly in line with business as usual scenario. And guest nights increases actually at a slightly greater rate than business as usual. Um, overall distance travels grows, but um, not at the same rate, at around about half the rate of business as usual. So under the decarbonisation scenario, the shape of tourism changes. A traveller will take the same number or more trips a year, but they will typically be travelling shorter distances. And I'm going to try and illustrate that to you now. So this is um, 2019 showing um, air, um, air travel, car travel and rail coach and other travel um, based around short, medium and long haul. Um, you can see that most trips were short or medium haul by road and rail. And that's basically the left hand side of the graph. A small proportion of trips were long haul by air. Um, however, as we know, this is the highly polluting area of travel, um, accounting for 19% of all emissions and just 1.9% of all travel towards the right-hand side. So if we leave this to business as usual, it grows like this. Um, emissions from longest haul flights will quadruple, um, and this is clearly a problem area for decarbonisation, as this is also the area of travel and tourism that is least ready for the transition. Growth in non-haul means that distance travel by air triples, making the possibility of covering this with 100% sustainable aviation fuel by 2050 simply unachievable. So what do we do instead? I'm just gonna flick a little bit here. So this, this is our scenario and this is business as usual. And you can see that under the tourism decarbonization scenario, the shape of tourism is different. The biggest growth areas will come from short and medium haul trips and those by electric car, rail, coach and ferry. Trips by plane do grow, they go up 19% by 2050 compared to 2019. But because stronger growth comes elsewhere in cars and rail and coach and ferry, it means that uh, travel by air goes from being 22.6% share of trips in 2019 down to 13.4% of trips in 2050. Overall distance travel grows by 40%, but that's around about half the rate of business as usual. Longer haul trips um, with a return journey of um, more than 7,000 kilometers will also grow, but again, less quickly than other distance classes. And so they go from being 6% of all trips to 3.5%. And to compare this to 2019, so you get a sense of where we um, are, are going from and to, I'm just going to do a bit more flicking between the two. So this is 2019, and you can see that most things grow, 
but they grow in a different way to business as usual. Okay, just one more point. Um, we saw, as we saw from an earlier slide, um, overall guest nights actually increase at a higher rate than business as usual, which is good news for accommodation and destinations. Um, there was a trend towards shorter and shorter trips, which we uh, try and slow down in the model, um, increasing the average length of stay to around about 3.7 nights um, away. This allows growth in tourism without the accompanying growth in CO2 associated with transport to the destination. So just to kind of recap, by 2050, um, with aviation, we see that um, we're basically saying that practically all aviation is, is um, covered by um, e-fuels, sustainable aviation fuel. Um, and that goes up from being around about 4% e-fuel in 2030. Um, we also have some electric um, planes at, by 2050, um, around about 4% capacity. Um, and 65% of all aircraft on order are electric. We don't offset at any point in the decarbonisation scenario. Um, Corsia uh, doesn't kick in um, as that only really kicks in for international um, aviation when you get above the 2019 baseline emissions and that doesn't happen at any point within our scenario because obviously we need to be uh, reducing, uh, not increasing. Um, plane tickets are also uh, more expensive due to the higher cost of using e-fuel um, but this cost does uh, will reduce as uh, electric flights become more and more prevalent. With car, you can see we've got 100% electric by 2050, and that is, and we assume 22% by 2030, uh, and that requires obviously some significant inf um, infrastructure investment. For rail and other transport such as ferries and coaches, um, there is investment in high speed track, uh, so 10 times more high speed rail track and electrification. Uh, nearly all transport in this category is now electric um, and there's a subsidy on train travel which means that tickets are less than half the cost in real terms um, of 2019. And from accommodation perspective uh, it's nearly all electric, 99% is now electric um, and virtually zero emissions coming from renewable resources. Sources, sorry. Um, so let's just imagine this for a moment. Um, we were trying to find a scenario that was um, really quite positive that we could all get behind um, for the travel and tourism industry, one where we can see we have a future and we're thriving. Um, so hopefully this is a world of opportunity for people. Uh, you can, you can, we can continue to travel and see the world uh, without killing it. In fact, in terms of distance traveled, around 90% of the trips from business as usual are there in the, in the decarbonization scenario unchanged in terms of distance at least. Uh, there's an increased cost of flying but alternatives become increasingly available and cheaper uh, such as high-speed trains. Um, where perceptions have changed um, we can imagine that uh, frequent flying isn't quite so as incentivized and glamorized perhaps as it is uh, uh, at the moment and closer to home trips will become more appealing, uh, challenging the, the current perception that um, going further afield is uh, somehow uh, has a greater value than um, uh, holidays closer to home. That implies new products and markets and new opportunities. There's less short hops, more longer, slower holidays and vacations. Uh, we have a lot more flexible working practices so we can go slower and go away for longer. Each long haul journey is a genuine trip of a lifetime and we maximize that to see more of, uh, of the places that we're going to and staying as long as we possibly can. And it's easy to book end-to-end -end travel with multiple stops and modes of transport, with new partnerships created and new products available. So what we're not saying is that this is about guilt tripping individuals into flying less. It's about changing the system over time with investment and finding new products and new markets. We just need to make the point at this at this time that there's a need for fair tourism strategies. Tourism isn't equitable, it's not equal now, but by um, looking at uh, the system, uh, we have to start thinking about this uh, in perhaps a more proactive and uh, conscious way, um, understanding that um, some destinations are less able to make green investments than others. Some are gonna be much more dependent on long haul travel. Some are uh, suffering more from climate change and probably did less than anyone else to uh, contribute to it. 
Um, and some are already fully developed, fully booked and full, whereas uh, others are still looking to develop their tourism. Um, and um, I sort of uh, 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 point to uh, the, uh, the image on the right there um, that um, one of our partners and sponsors um, shared with us, which is basically um, uh, showing where travel from flights is in the world. And you can see that it's very much more a global north thing than a global south thing. And I think we need to recognize that if we're saying, well, actually, you know, who does get to grow? And finally, just to summarize, um, this is about what the future holds and how we can uh, reshape tourism for 2030 and 2050, but we can do things now um, around that. So um, we need to start thinking about um, how we put um, our pressure from travel and tourism onto things like the transport um, uh, sector or energy sector to tell them what we need um, and understand where our investments need to go. Uh, we need to ensure that um, we really are making the emissions to and from destinations fully accounted for. They're not accounted for at the moment in plans, in the, in, uh, the Paris Agreement, and we need to start um, uh, taking responsibility for that and making sure that there's incentives to take that into account within our decision making. We need to start uh, identifying low and zero emission tourism options. Where are the products? They should be coming through so people can start to actually um, take um, on board some uh, uh, these decisions and opt for lower carbon uh, trips. And we need to better understand um, and plan for how uh, tourism will actually operate in a world that is moving towards uh, decarbonisation. So that's not just how to adapt to become decarbonized, but also what does the world look like um, in, uh, with some of the impacts that we know that climate is going to have. Uh, it will be disruptive for the tourism industry and we need to, we need to understand uh, our assets that we need to be looking after and the markets that we need to be uh, targeting. And above all, uh, we would uh, call on people to sign and implement the Glasgow Declaration because that is the right structure for uh, the tourism industry to um, have these conversations and to start planning. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Ben. Um, it, this is obviously a de detailed report, a lot of works gone into it and as you say Ben the message is a positive one for all the the scale of the the challenges I'm tempted to ask how to almost everything you said there but let's let's come back get back to that can I start with you uh uh Professor Peters um because you developed the the model that sits behind the the report. Could you just, in, in broad strokes, e e explain that this systems dynamics model? Yes, uh, thank you, of course. Um, indeed, the, the model is programmed uh, in system dynamics. That's actually the same method that was, for instance, used uh, in the world model that was uh, developed for the limits to growth report in the 1970s. So it's an old way and an established way of uh, programming uh, things. The advantage of system dynamics is that you can uh, actually let the system uh, bite its own tail. So the outcome of a certain calculation can go back into the input for that same calculation and try it in Excel and you will stop working immediately. <laughs> but in this system, you can. Uh, and that's important because the real world is full of that kind of feedback loops. Uh, and normally we have difficulty to, to model them. Uh, and this allows us to, uh, to model for very long periods. So the, the model is based in, uh, in uh, very detailed uh, data about travel and tourism in the global world since 1900, so for more than a century. And it looks ahead for another century. So the, the final date is 2100, so even further than 2050. Um, and that's possible because you make it a, a mechanistic kind of model instead of uh, just an, uh, a predicting model based on trends. So it's far more than just looking at trends. It combines the, the mechanisms behind the trends. Uh, and that allows you to, uh, to do quite strong things uh, in terms of uh, uh, implementing policies. Uh, so 
where a normal economic model would have difficulties to have a tax that's more than 10 percent to to really uh, uh, give an outcome that's reliable in this model we could uh, go even uh, to to 400 percent and uh, the model is still not crashing but it's also giving outcomes that, that we can understand so that's an important thing to uh, uh, to understand the model is uh, uh, or actually it's an um, uh, a kind of flight simulator for global tourism. <laughs> um, so it's it's modeled as a simulator and you can uh, literally run it in, in a serious game session. And that's what we did. So we had a full day where we uh, ran the model. We proposed uh, uh, several uh, combinations of all the 40 policies that you can, uh, can change in the model. And then immediately see, okay, this is working, this is not working, this is working, but it has a big disadvantage because, for instance, tourism uh, collapses uh, as a whole, which, of course, was not what we wanted. Um, and in that way, you get quite quickly learn very much about the whole tourism system. And that's the big advantage of, of playing such uh, serious games. Well, the outcomes have been uh, shown by, uh, by Ben, uh, of course. Um, yeah, the the most important indeed is I think that uh, actually in the zero emission scenario, 90% of all trips end up in the same kind of markets as they would have done in the business as usual one. And the big difference is, of course, that we will not destroy the climate in the zero emissions one. And in the other one, we would, as the tourism sector, contribute quite a lot to that. So maybe I could leave it with this for the moment. Sure, sure, yes. Um, maybe you're you, you're not the right person to ask uh, answer this question. Perhaps Ben is the right person. But why the assumption that that travel would uh, essentially double in in size by twenty fifty was that was that because you thought okay we we should accept that premise that growth is going to continue and see how what that would look like for the sector, how that might be might might be possible. But that might the, the fact that you made that assumption might surprise some people looking from the outside at the industry. Well, I think that um, actually this is based on, on uh, common things like the population is growing in the world. So that's already 20, 30 percent, maybe. <laughs> Uh, the economy is growing, so more people, uh, certainly in, in Asia, but also in Africa and in the South uh, America, they, they get more uh, income and then it's likely they start to travel. So that's another part of the, uh, the growth. Uh, then the, the, the cost of aviation, for instance, in business as usual would go down rather than up if you don't tackle it for climate change, of course. So just ignoring climate change. That would happen and that would give an incentive to even grow the distances we travel even more than the number of trips so it's it would be not wise to have a scenario that uh, approaches in a way that, that that we have no growth in the future and up to the end of the century we end up with uh, with something like 10 times the amount of air travel if we do nothing in the business as usual case. Okay. So, okay. And one final question to you at this stage, uh, Paul, if I may. Um, did you ex did you expect to end up with only one scenario that <laughs> would uh, take you to the you know see the industry end up uh, around about the target or? or what yeah, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, as a group, then I answer it. We didn't expect it. So I think, we, you, I think you probably uh, did, Paul. Different, way, <laughs> different ways to, uh, uh, to, to separate different uh, scenarios and have different approaches to, uh, to reach scenarios. But personally, I knew already it would, have, it would be very difficult to, uh, to find uh, a big range of scenarios that all can make the, uh, the zero emissions. And the, the reason is actually, if you would have done this 20 years ago, then probably we would have had more options to differentiate but we have waited quite a long time before we really started to uh, to recognize the problem and start uh, doing something about it and now the options are quite short 50 percent less emissions in, in in a matter of seven years is of course very very difficult yeah okay let's um can i go to you jens 
um, and start with a tourism dependent, uh, highly tourism dependent de destination. What are the implications of the findings of this study for Barbados? Uh, thank you, Ian, and thank you, Ben. So first of all, uh, I'm very honored to be part of this panel. And, and I think this, this report is very important, especially for small um, developing island nations like uh, Barbados. Um, so this report obviously kind of mirrors and supports what we're looking to do. And also um, it really uh, uh, supports what our honorable uh, prime minister uh, Mia Motley has been talking on the world stage uh, in Glasgow, uh, the UN, uh, and our national goal uh, to become um, carbon neutral by 2030. So obviously that's a that's a big goal, especially for a um, for a sit for a small developing island state. Um, but I I wanted to kind of point out a few things that we believe are important to get there. Uh, on this path to becoming net zero. And I think um, this is very much reflected in the report, but then obviously it's always hard to kind of take a report and put it into practice. So the first uh, thing I would say is, um, we obviously need to kind of promote sustainable tourism initiatives. And obviously sustainability is a big word of people talking about regeneration, but in essence, it's really in our case offering um, sustainable or ecotourism activities such as snorkeling, diving, nature walks, bird watching, ecologists, and so on. So that really helps to keep the local environment and the ecosystems healthy and create a low carbon tourism industry. Um, the second thing for us is then obviously also because people need to get around, even though the island is fairly small, um, but we're looking then obviously at green transportation systems. So this could be um, developing green transportation systems such as electric powered buses uh, that we have already, um, uh, which then obviously help reduce emissions and pollutions from, from vehicles. Um, there is also a tax incentive for people to get electric vehicles. So I actually, I drive an electric vehicle here uh, in Barbados. Um, so again, I think there are various initiatives when it comes to green transportation. Uh, the third thing I would point out is obviously utilizing renewable energies, uh, such as solar, wind, geothermal power. So there's a lot of opportunities, opportunities with that. And obviously, again, that helps reduce emissions and, and pollutions from traditional sources. Um, Waste management, I think, is another one, and sometimes that's forgotten in the tourism industry, but obviously people come and there's waste uh, produced. Um, so again, I mean, looking at how we can reduce um, the impact uh, of waste on uh, that are caused by tourism activities. So that obviously includes reducing single-use plastic, uh, which is something that's close to my heart, um, but there's also obviously um, really functional functioning uh, recycling systems as well that are, that are important and sometimes are overlooked as well. Um, being an island nation, I think the other piece uh, that's important is sustainable fishing practices. Uh, and I think that goes hand in hand, obviously, when we look at uh, to reduce overfishing um, and then obviously also to, to protect the local marine ecosystems. So again, that um, then will then maintain the health of the environment and also ensure that there will be fish for future generations. Um, the next thing I would like to focus on is really protecting local cultures. You know, I mean, I think in the end, uh, many times when people think about Barbados, they only think about beaches and obviously there are beautiful beaches here, but there's a lot more to Barbados. There are um, authentic local experiences and really that um, integrating that with tourism then also protects the tangible and the intangible heritage. And that's why people come to travel to a destination. So the local community should then also be included in the decision-making process to ensure that their needs are taken into consideration. Okay, yes, um, can, sorry, sorry to interrupt The next interrupt thing you. I want to quickly talk about. Can, can I, sorry to interrupt you, but. I'm I'm quite I'm aware of the time ticking by, yeah. and and I want to try and keep to the subject substance of the study it, 
it, itself, really, rather than have an yeah. overarching discussion about sustainability. All, all the things you've raised are important, but I'm most interested in, in the implications of the study's finding for destinations, tour operators, and, and, and so on, and, and also in how the, the actions that are required are, could possibly come about. So I'll come back to you, Jens, but can I go to Rochelle, please? Uh, Rochelle, so Exodus travels, a lot of adventure, a lot of long haul travel. What are the implications for Exodus of the findings of this study? Uh, thanks, Ian, and I, I, I love this study. I think it's fantastic and, and very, very timely because we've never seen anything like all of these different scenarios put together in one place. And I, I think it's an excellent report. So well done to everybody involved in, in putting it together. You know, I, I, I don't think it's any surprise that the shape of the tourism industry does need to change. Um, yes, Exodus does a lot of long haul, but actually the majority of our market is short haul into short haul destinations actually, particularly in Europe. Um, we have recently started implementing a lot of rail travel um, we have domestic holidays as well. Now, do we offer that enough or are enough people taking those up? Probably not. And that will necessarily have to be a shift according certainly to this report for the future. One of the things I was really interested in in this report is something that um, isn't given much mention, but it really jumped out to me. It's called the value of distance factor, which means if, if I'm understanding it correctly, when people are choosing between two destinations that are equal in all aspects, except the distance to home. So one has a beach, the other has a beach, one has great culture, the other has great culture, one has nightlife that you like and the other does as well. People generally prefer the destination that's furthest away. Now, what does that mean for us as a travel company in order to shift behaviors and make that closer destination more appealing? How do we nudge people the right way to say, actually, although this destination on the other side of the world that will take you 16 hours to get to is amazing, there is this other amazing destination that you can travel to by train. And, and those shifts, I think, and using behavioral science and, and trying to create opportunities where people can see the value of shorter distance is something that I've not come across before in terms of this concept, but I'm really interested in, in knowing more because I think it's things like that in how you shift behaviors and how you get people to think more clearly about the carbon element in addition to all of the other things that they'll be doing that will be part and parcel of making the changes that we need to for the future. Okay, but just on, on that, Rochelle, I, I, I know the the um, study finds that 81% of all trips under the scenario outlined by 2050 would be by shorter distance, less than 900 kilometer, kilometers. But so that would preclude people from the UK going to Spain, for example, uh, for, for trips when that's the single most popular destination at the moment. And, it, and it's not just about there being a beach, there's beautiful beaches all around the coast of Britain, aren't there? But they're, they, they won't have the sun to the same e e extent. So there's a reason people go to, to Spain. Or, yeah, or I don't think it, it, I don't think it precludes them from traveling. I think it, in, in, it requires us as, as travel companies to um, engender the, the fact or the belief and the experience of making the journey part of the experience and taking the time, seeing the scenery, going slowly to get from point A to point B. And we've got a number of our cus customers who are particularly interested in taking the train to the destination for that very reason, because they can spend the time seeing all the things that you normally fly over. And it's not going to be for everyone, but I think that there is a genuine market of how you can market the slow travel, the journey as part of the experience in a way that we've perhaps not focused very much on um, as an industry in, uh, in recent times. Okay, and just finally, while I'm, I'm with you, Rochelle, the, the studies view that the current strategies for achieving net zero at the moment are woefully inadequate. You, you share that view. Um, I, th I think we all need to do more. So we have just gone through an exercise where we have mapped the carbon impact of every single one of the trips that we offer. 
now we there have a baseline and we understand okay certain parts of the world there is less solar there is less renewable energy but are there things that we can do to the contracting to make sure that all things being equal we have a renewable powered hotel versus one that's not but having this baseline and understanding where we are in the initial stages i think is something that all companies need to do because we just tend not to know enough um, in terms of how we then need to make these changes and what actions we actually need to, to go through in order for things to happen in the way they need to. Okay, uh, Sophia, can I come to you? The, what are the implications for, you might just want to quickly explain what, what tour radar is because I don't know that everybody will know. I'm, I confess I, I didn't know. Um, but also what are the implications for, for, for your business? Yeah, um, thank you so much. Um, so first, Tourator, we are online and winter booking platform, and we have over 50,000 of organized adventures on our platform from 2,500 operators worldwide. Um, so we are a marketplace for tour operators, but we have our distribution site as well, and travel agents, they can uh, book adventures for their customers through our platform as well. Um, and obviously, um, I will sign everything what Rochelle said before me. Um, I would love to highlight uh, that the findings of the report and the tourism decarbonization scenario shows actually how um, how much you know, like we depend on each other in our sector, these intersectoral connections between all different kind of stakeholders, and how we actually you know like um, need each other. Um, to move forward, because at the moment we all face uh, this reality that adaptation, sustainable development, and actually success of your own product depends on the products on the products uh, of other stakeholders from your ecosystem. Um, and I always love to say, um, if you want to succeed and we want to move forward, we actually need um, to work together. Um, when it comes to us, because you know, like we are online adventure booking platform so we are not the ones who is actually on the front line as exodus travel for example um for us is important how we actually can um, support all of them how we can support two operators how we can support um, destinations uh by actually you know like um make the first step uh, for the um, sustainable development and achieve their net zero goals um and especially i'm on that with rochelle you know like um we have seen like in our ecosystem, we have so many two operators, we have big two operators, we have smaller two operators, and we consider ourselves as kind of a bridge that we can help the smaller two operators to make this first step, because not everyone can do their carbon measurements for all of their tours. So we started to work on a tool that can be, um, that is open sourced on our platform and can be used by op operators to measure the CO2 footprint of their tours. And actually you not know, like to do this first step because you need the first benchmark, um, like where do I stand when I compare myself to everyone else and where I can move forward. So like this was like the first step that we wanted to see how we can support each other. We listen to the two operators, what are their struggles, um, scope free, the biggest struggle for like for everyone in our industry and how we can actually make it available, um, the carbon measurement and management for everyone in our, in our sector and organized adventure sector. Um, so yeah, like, and again, back carbon labeling will play a big role when it comes to accelerating the decarbonization process in our industry. And of course, in education of our customers, um, like, exactly how you bring the people who want to do like yeah, a beach vacation um, to travel somewhere not that far or not to go on all-inclusive vacation that has actually the triple size of CO2 footprint than um, an organized adventure by um, Exodus Travel, for example. So how would you do that? Sorry to interrupt you. Would you, yeah. would you not offer an all-inclusive? Um, no, I mean, you know, like um, carbon labeling, you know, like they're just making this okay. aware for the customer. Um, this tour has 300 kilograms of CO2 and actually how we came to this number. And this tour has 150 kilograms of CO2 and how we came to this number. Because, you know, like at the moment we see everywhere these labels, but people 
they don't actually know what to start with this number. You know, like what does actually 350 kilograms of CO2 mean to you? Um, is it bad? Is it a lot? Is it less? And that's why it's important to compare. And that's like where we want to move forward with um, our adventure booking platform that you actually can see the footprint of all adventures. And you can, as a tour operator, you can compare and see where your adventure stands. As a customer, you can see this tour has 15% less of CO2 and so on and so on. And of course, you know, like moving forward, um, digital transformation will be um, a must and using data to analyze travel's behaviors, using data to analyze booking data um, will be, um, yeah, needs to be um, leveraged um, by, you know, like by all online platforms by all two operators and actually that you can you know like see and identify gaps market gaps for transportation accommodation to analyze these highly trafficked areas as ben mentioned before you know like these fully evolved visitor economies and we have some places that actually lacking all of that and this is why we need data to see how we can manage all of this so like Database okay. retailing will be everything in the next years. Okay, well, yeah, all retailers think data is everything. I agree with you about that. So you'll be providing tools, you'll be giving visibility and hopefully educating customers. We'll leave aside the whole question of standardization of measurement and yeah. harmonization of certification and so on, because that's a whole other area. I want to come to Eval, but can I just come back to Paul for a second first, Eval, if you'll forgive me, Paul. Why has why does this study not look at scope three emissions? I, I found the explanation for why uh, not convincing. And at the same time, the major tour operators uh, are looking at the hospitality groups are looking at they're starting to look at their scope three emissions seriously. So are you suggesting that that's a waste of time? They shouldn't be doing that. Uh, what, what, what's the study saying? Uh, well, we did not include it. Uh, first of all, it's extremely complex. If you talk about data, then certainly for the, the accommodation sector, for instance, the, the, the carbon footprint of food that is used by the, the people in the restaurants, it's extremely difficult. You find values that, that vary easily a factor 10. So uh, what to make from them? So that's, a, that's an issue practical. Uh, the other one is that um, you have also a more philosophical issue with those types of um, uh, emissions, because if you stay at home, you would still eat. Uh, and so you have to subtract as well something. And if you are at home, you heat your home. If you are not at home, hopefully you don't. <laughs> uh, and you don't use the lights and, and, and other things. So there is an exchange where uh, being a tourist is not so special for the carbon footprint. The only thing that really stands out is the transport uh, emissions, because that's very much additional to your daily life. Um, and uh, in some cases, uh, for instance, tour operators consider uh, transport emissions scope three, because they look only at the, the, the office uh, emissions, but of course, in our study, that scope three is fully part of the whole thing, uh, and the transport companies uh, are uh, completely uh, included in it. So the scope three is is mainly about indeed what in accommodation uh, is happening, and a little bit of those offices for the tour operators, but that's that's really very little. <laughs> so we didn't uh, look at that. Okay, all right. Thank you for explaining that. Hey, Evald, uh, thank you for being uh, patient. Um, you, you've pointed out um, uh, that the, the study refutes the idea that tourism uh, must cease or, or, or not grow and people must stop flying. So that's a positive message for people in, in the industry. But how do you see the, 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 act, the target set in the study being achieved? Well, that's... That's the million dollar question, isn't it, Ian? Um, thank you for coming to me. And I've, I've, I've got a couple of points to make on this. If you, if you allow me to appreciating that, that um, your audience might get, um, might get tired. Um, but um, I think, of course, this study shows clearly that, that tourism doesn't have to see success. Luckily, uh, you know, I work in tourism. I love tourism. I love travel. Um, but at the same time, the study also shows, I think, that 
we can't rely on just saying that we're going to innovate fast enough. Um, so that allows us, those two notions, to, to move beyond these either or discussions that we're having right now, that you see happening right now in our polarized society, where it seems that you're either a techno optimist who believes that innovation will solve everything, or you're a degrowth enthusiast who is like, we should change our society from now on, and that will solve everything. Both those um, uh, uh, opposite sides of the debate um, can't be true, this study shows it. We have to do both in a sense, weirdly enough. It shows almost that it's, it's, it's complicated and we have to accept that it's complicated. So we have to have, dare to have these complicated discussions as well. That also means, I believe, asking different questions. It's not, shall we invest in uh, sustainable aviation fuel or e-fuel or do something else? No, we have to do both. And to be able to make it even more complicated, um, we have, to do it as equitable as possible, which is, of course, an even harder question. But we have to ask these, otherwise we're not going to make it, do we? Um, so as well as having the discussion on how can we do it as equitable as possible, we also have to discuss, have to have the discussion about how can we scale up the necessary innovations. But one of the things I think for DMOs or NCOs especially are interesting, like Rochelle said as well uh, for tour operators, is the behavioral aspects. According to the IPCC, 60% of the change that we need should come from behavioral change. We work with consumers and companies every day as a, as, a, as, a, as a demo. We should learn as fast as possible how can we influence them uh, and how can we uh, influence companies to make the changes necessary, to help them make the right choices. Recent studies show that about 80% of both entrepreneurs and consumers want to travel more sustainably. But when we look at the actions, there's, there's a big gap. Uh, not everyone knows how to. Uh, financial incentives are in the way, social norms are in the way, or simply habits are in the way. So if we learn how we can influence them, we can maybe help speed up this process and maybe also help to make these hard questions I, asked, uh, I mentioned earlier to help them make maybe become a little bit less hard. And are you saying that at the moment you don't know, we don't know how to influence behavior? I think the notions are out there, but we're not applying them to tourism every day. Well, well, of course, some are. I'm, I'm sure that, that the big travel companies in the world, like a booking or an Expedia or Google, know exactly how they can online, for example, make sure that you uh, might book uh, a little bit faster than you would otherwise. But especially DMOs who are in con contact with a lot of companies and a lot of con consumers could do, could do better on this. What would work, for example? Do lab does, does labeling work? Does, do certification work for consumers? Um, uh, for example, changing the standard. So now, for example, when you look at conference bids, uh, when you come to the travel section, the first thing you see is that the destination is reachable by air, by, by aviation in a mul multitude of ways instead of saying, well, we've got other ways to come here as well. If we change the standard, what does that do? Does it entice delegates in this example to travel more sustainably? It might. Uh, and we have to learn as fast as possible how we can influence it in, in, in that sense as well, especially okay, but, DMOs are in a position to do that. Okay, but surely the whole, the global marketing advertising industry is based on the, the, the premise that it, behavior can be influenced. And that's happening now. You'd be having to. So what you're talking about is countering the the global impact of uh, getting people to spend more. Of course, and and I would say that we are all experts in marketing, both the most NTOs and these companies. But there's of course this famous famous marketing saying that marketing works for fifty percent, but we don't know which fifty percent, right? Yeah. So let's let's dive into this and let's dive into which nudges work best. Um, and share this knowledge as well, you know, don't, don't keep this for yourself because we're talking about the next existential threat here. Let's, let's look at it professionally, uh, work together on this, collaborate on this, um, and see how we can influence these, both of these consumers and these companies to, to do a little bit better every, uh, every day, and we just might make it. Okay. Um, Rochelle, can I ask you a question which is perhaps a bit unfair because I don't think you weren't responsible for the report, but, but one of the... Um, 
the, the findings of the, the study is that um, it doesn't see taxation contributing very much, not being a very useful uh, tool, essentially, in affecting be behaviour. Does, does that gel with what, what you've seen? You were previously a chief economic forecaster for the World Travel and Tourism uh, Council, weren't you? Uh, I, I wouldn't call myself chief economic forecaster. <laughs> okay. Well, I did. <laughs> you know, I did, but yes, I worked for WTTC. Um, you know, with, with all of these things, it, it depends on the amount, doesn't it? So it depends on the amount of taxation that's going to be in, in play to try and change behavior. There will be people for whom no amount of taxation because they have the means to be able to afford it. Whereas those that um, can't afford any increase in price will suffer. And, and we see that when, you know, there are downturns generally, that when things cost more, people stop purchasing. So I, I think I have to refer to those that, that wrote the report and the analysis that they did on taxation for this. But I think we all know that you know, the sort of market of demand and supply is that when prices go up, demand declines. I guess it just depends on how much it needs to go up by for things to be taxed appropriately for behavior to change. But did you want to add anything to that, Paul? Yes, uh, please, thank you. Um, indeed, we, we tried taxes quite strong, up to, uh, for instance, a 200% increase of the ticket tax for aviation. And that does have an effect, of course, but it doesn't bring the emissions even down. It, it levels them off. So indeed, at that moment, you, uh, you put the aviation sector partly out of growth. But much further you couldn't get unless you go to 10,000%, uh, where the model has uh, little problems to, to still follow it. And then it, it simply disappears. But that, of course, is not what you want. So therefore, we chose in the end, okay, uh, because if you tax, you reduce the volume, but not necessarily also the in, it stimulate the innovation. So if we mandate the e-fuels, so the, the, the sustainable alternative fuels, um, up to 100% in 2050, and those fuels are quite expensive, then we still uh, increase the ticket prices by uh, almost 100% in the end. Um, but then you solve the problem because... 100% e-fuels means no emissions. And there are other limitations why you cannot grow still with aviation, but that, that's another story. But so then you have not taxed in an indirect way to uh, achieve an environmental effect, but you have put the environmental effect first that costs money. So the polluter pays. And of course, there is a volume effect as well that helps to achieve the final goal. Okay, and just while you, you, you've, uh, you're speaking, Paul, there was a, a study, a separate study out in the last few days, which advocated flight rationing. And of course, we've seen rationing in the, in, in the past, rationing of food when there are shortages during war and so on. For, uh, flight rationing, that wasn't something you looked at. Uh, no, no, uh, except, well, to some extent, uh, we had to bring down the growth of aviation to almost zero, and we did that by assuming uh, that there was a global limit on the total number of slots in the world. That's one way to do it. Um, another way could be that you say uh, there is uh, this mandate for fuel, uh, for instance, and if there is a limited amount of, uh, of uh, e-fuels available, then the volume has to go down to meet the requirement. It would be another way to achieve the same. Uh, so that, yeah. Basically, we did something like this, and the, the rationing or the distribution of those slots, you could quite easily fit it into the ICAO, uh, the, the, that's the International Civil Aviation Organization. They have, for instance, the, uh, the offsetting uh, system, and in the offsetting system, they have a whole regulation to, to save uh, developing countries from taking most of the burden, so they get least of the burden. Well, the, the rich counties take most, and you could use the same mechanism to, uh, uh, to organize that the developing countries get more slots relatively, and not only the historical ones, because that's very little. Uh, and for instance, islands like Barbados, they could claim a little bit more under such a system, 
because they depend 100% on aviation. While, for instance, a place like uh, Innsbruck in Austria, they have every mode of transport and every market close. So they can let go a little bit more of the slots and still have a, a, a very good uh, tourism business. So that would be the, the, the way how it might work in the, in the future. Okay, so there's an element of the ICAO's Corsia system that you, you think is, is valuable, even though Corsia yeah, itself yeah, even is though, irrelevant. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, the, the offsetting itself we, we have uh, discarded in uh, because in a zero emission world, there is no offsets anymore, only planting trees. But we know now already that the claims for planting trees are much bigger than the whole world can, uh, can have. So that's going nowhere in the end. Um, but that element in Corsia could, could be used. And ICAO certainly is able to organize this if there is a political pressure from enough countries that they should do that. Because that's how it works. Countries must ask for such uh, regulations and we all can do that. Okay, uh, I'm conscious of the time and, and Jens may have to go in, in a minute, but Ben, can I come to you uh, with, with, a, with a question? Um, the report refers uh, several times to uh, the question of what, what is fair and uh, you made the point in your presentation that travel and tourism is not equitable now. How can it be made so? Broad strokes, how could it be made equitable? Uh, well, I think the problem is that the, at the moment there's a promise that um, the world will become more equitable. We will all grow to a point where we have reached uh, kind of parity and um, and as soon as you start to look at future scenarios where we might be saying that there are limits uh, because the world does have limits then suddenly you start to question well hang on a minute you know uh, that you know if, if we capped everything as it is now is that fair say uh, if, we're, if that's essentially what we're saying for aviation we you know we mustn't uh, grow the distance um, beyond 2019 levels, well, that might make us all feel very happy in in places where the um, you know we have airports that are um, uh, fully functioning and uh, we can get about as as we like. But you know there are countries that are expecting to be able to build airports and and travel and travel more and all the rest of it. Um, how we do that? Um, I, I mean, it's, it's it's been very difficult for us to go into that territory in the report. Um, we recognise the importance of having these conversations, and I think it's the, the it's an invitation for us to, to begin these conversations really more than anything. Um, it, I'm not sure if it's really the Travel Foundation's place or anyone here's place to say this is how we should allocate things. This is who should and shouldn't travel. You know, is it more important that someone travels for to visit friends and family than it is for a holiday? Is it more important for someone to travel on business or to travel because they need their leisure time? It, you know, I'm not sure if it, it's something that any one organization should be dictating um, or even any small group of people should be dictating, but it's a conversation we need to have. Um, and if we don't have it, we know what will happen. The uh, travel and tourism will become ever more inequitable um and you know and as we've seen has happened you know in in history um so that that's that's what we're calling for is is you know it needs planning it needs thinking and that needs to happen at a at an international level with international organizations like paul was just uh, referring to a minute ago okay um there's a whole other set of questions there but we haven't got time to go in them I, I'm interested in the this, the idea of capping uh, the longest haul flights. It seems particularly harsh on Australia and New Zealand. I had a quick look before I came on the, the this webinar, and that they would lose out most in, in everywhere, if you like. But, but you know, Barbados, for example, would only be denied visitors from Australia and New Zealand, it would it seem, in the, and the Pacific Islands, maybe. And from the UK, you could go to most places in the world, except Australia, New Zealand, and the Pacific Islands. So um, I, 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 by chance last night, I met um, Two uh, sort of public affairs people for the industry, representing the airlines, representing tour operators, and and said this study uh, had this finding, and they both said it had never happened. So forget it. 
What what what's your response to that? Who who would like to respond to that? Paul, Ben, Ben, Paul. Um, of course, their idea of doing business is, is the growth model. So they assume growth. Otherwise, they they say we won't exist anymore, <laughs> and you will never do from your your own business perspective. On the other hand, what they forget is um, all the innovations we need, and and the aviation sector also wants. That's in the e-fuels, but also in the uh, zero emission hydrogen fuel cell uh, aircraft, that sort of things. They are working on it. They have to be paid for. And the problem is in the current model where the, the price is the bottom, you don't have a margin to pay those trillions you need for these investments. If you create scarcity by uh, temporarily limiting growth, then the prices go up because there is demand. We know that, that's the, the, the value of distance. There will be demand. The prices go up, the margins go up, and then you have the opportunity and the money and the funding to do all the uh, invest, uh, investments that are needed. And then after a couple of decades, we may restart growth if we are successful with those innovations. And otherwise, maybe everyone has forgotten about those long distances. And let's face it, uh, regarding Australia and, um, uh, and New Zealand, they could still go to each other. <laughs> so they can still travel uh, international and they are huge countries. They have so much in uh, in their own uh, region, uh, and and the and that's the odd thing of the value of distance. We value a trip to New Zealand as very high, and the New Zealanders value a trip to the United Kingdom to Scotland also very high. The landscapes are more or less equal, so it's a psychological thing we have to to deal with probably more than than uh, a practical or an economic uh, issue if all the new zealanders go uh, domestic then the tourism sector there is is okay with that okay that's that, that's a good response look we, we're out of time i just want to ask uh, each of you very quickly you have to just be a, a minute each i think what what happens now where where do you go from here are you going to use the report uh, jens Thank you, Ian. I, I think for us, um, it comes really down to training and awareness. I think that would be the number one, kind of start to train the tourism employees, but also the governments. Um, also um, looking at linkages, so because tourism is obviously wider than just uh, airlines, hotels and tour operators. So make sure that the entire visitor economy is in, in, involved in that. And with that, then there is a mindset um, to really the importance of uh, driving and, and, and reducing emissions. So that would be our thing. Thank okay, you. Very I, good. I, I have to go, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Jens. It's good to see thank you. Thank you. So, okay. Sophia, where, what happens now for you? Um, collaboration and working together on solutions and working together with the MOS and two operators if we have long haul flights, how we bring people to stay longer in this destination, what kind of product adjustment needs to happen there that travelers find like that these destinations are attractive for them to stay longer than just 10 days in these destinations. And if it's short haul um, vacations, then how we can bring them to travel there by train, by coaches, by car and yeah, working together, being loud together to to demand the, the support and financial support, non-financial support from governments and from supply chains and the whole industry. Very good. Rochelle, what happens next? What happens next? Well, you know, uh, Exodus is a signatory of the Glasgow Declaration. We have made a commitment to halve our carbon emissions by 2030. Um, and we need to continue on that path. And, and part of the work say, we've recently done in analyzing all our trip emissions helps us to, to do that. But there needs to be this wider collaboration. There also needs to be great, a lot more research. And, and that's where I wanna see say, some of these behavioral changes, the nudges, are they possible? How can we trial them? Let's start doing some examples and work together as an industry to, to see what we could possibly do. You know, it's a really scary figure that 1.9%, or yeah, what is it? 1.9% of all trips long haul represent 19% of emissions. You know, that 
is where we need to start thinking about, well, where are those alternatives that are closer to home and less carbon intensive that we need to change as an industry? Okay. Hey, Val. Lastly, um, last year we in the Netherlands published a roadmap towards climate neutral tourism with partners. We just described what we have to do in the Netherlands to get to climate neutral tourism. We'll continue to work on that with these partners in the Netherlands. We as a company will help doing research. Um, I might get in contact with Rochelle to see how we can collaborate on this behavior research. Um, but also we will be working with destinations, for example, to see how they can implement their own climate action plans and make sure that entrepreneurs uh, and consumers alike, uh, alike uh, uh, how we can help them make, make, make the best choices uh, ASAP. Okay, very good. Paul, what does this, do you, would you carry on developing the model, working on the model, or, or would you go on to something different now? Uh, no, I will certainly uh, still work on the model. I, I am because we are also planning a scientific paper uh, about this scenario and we have to do a couple of things for it. Um, another thing that I would like to do is I will present this in, in several uh, occasions at conferences. Uh, there are some planned already, uh, but playing this model, this game, this serious game with some of the of the CEOs in the industry, that would be very effective, I think. If they would spend two hours with us together to really get the uh, the assignment, you have now to reduce the emissions to uh, to zero. Okay, be my guest. This, these are the options. Okay, let's see if we can uh, help with that. Ben, yeah. what 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 is the Travel Foundation going to do with the study? Well, yeah, I mean, we, we, you know, it's going to take something to get this fully communicated out there. It's a big report. There's a lot in there and, and there's a lot to unpack. Um, and thank you for helping us to do some of that uh, today. Um, we'd, we just want to continue to better understand the future that we need to plan for. Um, the fu that future is coming. We're not necessarily advocating for that future. That future is coming. There is, all the drivers are there for that future to, ha to have to happen one way or another. And we want to make sure that businesses and destinations are preparing for that and are going to see the opportunities um, in that future. Um, so that's what we're trying to do. And I think from our perspective, we need to, as um, Sophia was saying, um, encourage that collaboration. We're, you know, as a NGO, we are well placed to be that facilitator um, across destinations, across businesses, to try and bring that collaboration together um, so that we can explore some of these solutions that Rochelle was talking about. Can we actually start to bring some of these things um, to the market, actually see the, the, the new platforms that we need to have to enable some of these um, changes to be made. Um, so try, just try and bring, bring some of this together so that people can see uh, the direction that they can go in. Very good. Ben, Rochelle, Sophia, any vote? Paul and, and Jensen is absent. Thank you very much. And it is a very good report, well worth reading.